I want to start with a poll. How many of you here have heard of gene therapy before? Raise a hand. Okay. Keep your hands up for a second. And if you haven't raised your hand yet, you, you probably should, but how many of you, with your hands up, have been treated with or know someone else who's been treated with gene therapy? Pretty much every hand just went down. Okay, regardless of how you answered those two questions, I want you to look at this list of diseases on the screen behind me. Please raise your hand if you or someone you know has been diagnosed with any of these diseases. Would it surprise you to know that this is a list of diseases which gene therapy is currently being used to treat and successfully? So why don't more people have access to gene therapy? Because it's complicated and expensive. I've been doing gene therapy for nine years in October. And I'm going to tell you two stories. The first patient I ever gave gene therapy to, and another patient who changed my mindset about how we need to be thinking about how to make treatments available to everyone. This is Charlie, the first patient that I gave gene therapy to. In 2009, Charlie was in his early 50s, living with his wife and his daughter in Homer, Alaska, practicing as a psychiatrist, doing what most of us would do on the 4th of July, celebrating with friends and family on a lake. About midway through the day, Charlie came in from a little boat ride, and his wife noticed that his speech was slurring. She thought at first, have you been drinking? But he hadn't. In fact, it was something more serious than that. A trip to the ER and a head scan showed that Charlie had stage four brain cancer, glioblastoma multiforme. A few months before Charlie's diagnosis in 2009, this disease killed Senator Ten Kennedy. Two weeks ago, Senator John McCain was diagnosed. In fact, about 192,000 people around the world will be diagnosed with this disease in the next year, and 17,000 of them will lose their battle with it. It's a highly aggressive form of cancer. Most patients, including Charlie, only have a 50% chance of surviving one year, and that's with intensive therapy that includes surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, more chemotherapy. Charlie felt like he needed to try something more. And he took the chance on a clinical trial, and it happened to be our clinical trial for gene therapy to treat his disease. Now in 2009, this map is showing you the number of centers around the world who were doing some form of gene therapy. Now, I told you Charlie lived in Alaska, so it may seem like he came to Seattle because it was the closest to him, but in fact, in 2009, we were the only center doing gene therapy for glioblastoma. While each of these centers was capable, they were all studying different diseases, different clinical trials. Why did Charlie even have to come to Seattle? Well, the type of gene therapy we were giving him is called blood cell gene therapy. We have to first bring him into the clinic, take blood cells out of him. Then we have to move those to a clean room facility because all of the manipulation we're going to do is going to happen outside of the body. This is an example of what our clean room facility in Seattle looks like, controlled airflow, highly skilled staff, equipment monitoring, regulation of every material and reagent that comes in and out, multi-million dollar infrastructure. Once we have the cells there, maybe we don't want all the blood cells, maybe we only need T cells, or maybe we only need stem cells. So now we need to separate those out. That takes more complex technology and people who know how to use it. After that, we have to get the DNA into those cells that we want to target. This is a snapshot of what part of that process looks like. It can take anywhere from two to 14 days, depending on the cell and the type of the DNA that you're trying to get in. You see three people in this photo. One person who's reading directions line by line, one person who's actually performing those instructions one at a time, and a third person who's observing to make sure that they all get done correctly and in the right order. Again, multi-million dollar infrastructure. After all that manipulation, we have to make sure those cells are ready to go back into the patient and that they're safe, that we haven't introduced a contaminant, that they're functioning the way that they should be. And then and only then can they go back to the hospital and get infused into the patient. That is, of course, unless your patient shows up wearing a Michigan shirt when he knows that you are a rival Ohio State University fan. <laughs> so I told him I would only let him take this picture if I could cover it up. 
Not only did Charlie have to come to Seattle for two weeks to receive this gene therapy, he had to stay for another two weeks to be monitored after that, and then he had to come back to Seattle every three to four weeks for nine months for additional treatment and research. So was all that bang worth its buck? Well, in addition to Charlie, we treated, treated 10 more patients, and we changed the survival from less than 50% at one year to 100% at one year. Charlie got six and a half years, enough time to see his daughter graduate from that horrid University of Michigan, <laughs> the ability to go back to work full time until his retirement. But he didn't know that in 2009. I didn't know that in 2009. None of us could have predicted that that would be the outcome. So I want to ask you a question. You don't need to raise your hand this time. If you'd been given a diagnosis with a prognosis of 11 months, would you be willing to leave your community, your family, your friends, your coworkers, and take a chance on something like this? Nine out of those 11 months, he had to be back and forth in Seattle. So when I treated Charlie, along with the team at Fred Hutch in 2009, this is what I was thinking about. Thank goodness he was willing to take this chance. What if we could move this therapy to where he is? How can we move gene therapy to where the 200,000 people that are going to be diagnosed this year are going to be? That was the first time I thought about how can we simplify this, think about how to get more clinics doing this. That same year, I was going to be confronted with a problem in gene therapy of much larger scale and proportion. And it was all started by this man, Timothy Ray Brown. He's also known as the Berlin patient, or the only man on the planet right now who's been cured of an HIV infection for more than 10 years. Now, Timothy didn't get gene therapy. What he got was a blood cell therapy from a person whose DNA made their blood cells resistant to HIV infection. While that was a one in a million treatment for Timothy, it paved the way for gene therapy to become a treatment option for HIV positive persons around the world and affect the same type of outcome. That would mean not having to take antiretroviral drugs every day for the rest of their lives. In 2013, Dr. Hans-Peter Kiem showed here, along with the American Foundation for AIDS Research, the Timothy Ray Brown Foundation, and the National Institute of Health, received a grant along with other colleagues at Fred Hutch as part of a large collaboratory to study how we could make gene therapy to treat HIV a reality. As part of this funding source, we in Seattle get to host an HIV cure meeting once a year. It's actually going to be in the next few weeks. And that meeting not only includes researchers who are working on how to make gene therapy for HIV a possibility, it also includes persons living with HIV, community advocate members like Josh, and others. That was, in 2014, the first time I saw this map. This is a map of HIV prevalence in the, in the world. Darker blue means more HIV positive persons. Now between 2009 and 2013, the number of clinics capable of doing gene therapy definitely increased, but you can see that there's still a very large problem with distribution. And we're not talking about 200,000 people a year. We're talking about more than 36 million people living with HIV right now, another 2.1 million every year, 150,000 of which will be children who primarily live in sub-Saharan Africa. So same meeting, sitting here thinking about all of this stuff. Prominent researcher comes up on the stage talking about gene therapy and how we're making it a possibility. Person living with HIV, sitting in the audience, raises their hand and says, the hope is amazing. How do you envision getting this complex therapy to the millions of patients who need it? And the researcher's response was, well, first we have to show it can work, and then we'll figure out how to get it there. What? Would you want a treatment that had been developed someplace else on people who didn't share your genetics, didn't share your culture, didn't share your environment, didn't share your lifestyle? We know that those things all impact how treatment outcomes are affected. So I'm sitting there going, I don't think that's okay. There has to be a way 
for us to do this now. And if none of these people are going to stand up and do it, then I guess I'll try. So I thought about this process, all this complex infrastructure and technology that's required. Well, obviously, if we could just put the DNA in a syringe and take that around the world and inject it into a person, that would be great. And I can tell you that we're working on that. And for some of those diseases on that list, we're going to get there sooner than others. But for glioblastoma and HIV, not so quickly. The reason is that the blood cell we need to hit with our DNA is a stem cell that sits in the bone marrow. And there are very few. So we don't yet have the technology to inject DNA and have it get to enough of those very few cells in the marrow and not get to a bunch of other cells that we don't want it to go to. So we still need to do this outside of the body. OK, so I know what we need. I have all these things, right? We've got to be able to process the blood product. We've got to be able to get to the cells we want. We need to be able to keep those cells happy outside the body for a period of time. We need to be able to add the DNA in a specific order and sequence. So I just started looking. What technologies are already out there? There has to be some things that I can sort of piecemeal together to make this go, right? To maybe put it into a box that we can just ship around the world. And coincidentally, I found one device. It's manufactured by a German company. It couldn't do gene therapy, but it had all the components that we needed actually already in one unit. So we bought one. We said, OK, let's see if we can reconfigure this to do what we need to do in the order we need to do it. Sometimes that took hands-on effort. I like to tell people this bag hanger only comes standard on devices purchased in Hawaii and the Caribbean. <laughs> I was just the only one tall enough to reach that high at the time. Other times we had to blend technologies really complex ones, <laughs> to get what we needed, until we found that someone else also already manufactured that, and we can just incorporate it into our system. It took two years and more than 20 healthy people donating their blood products to us to practice on as if they were gene therapy patients before we came to this. Gene therapy in a box on a portable table meets all the same criteria that the multi-million dollar infrastructure clean room meets, can go anywhere, it comes with pre-programmed interfaces. In theory, all the things that you would need to add the DNA, to add the gene, can be things that you could get from a pharmacy, provided in a kit. It's a proof of concept. Hasn't left Fred Hutch yet. We're working on that part. Getting the word out there is part of that battle. We think that now there's no excuse why we can't be treating close to 60 million people on the planet, or at least overcoming those last barriers to getting that much gene therapy out into the world. We also think that the more people have access to this type of treatment, the more diseases we're going to discover could be benefited by this treatment approach. That means that we can treat patients like Charlie, patients like Timothy, patients like everyone in this room, wherever they exist in their own communities. So if you think that you might be a candidate for gene therapy, talk to your doctor about it. They're the ones who are going to have to let us in the door. If you're a healthy person, consider donating blood or other tissues to research so that more scientists like me can develop new approaches like this. I want to say thank you especially to all of the patients that we treated in Seattle and around the world with gene therapy because they did take a big risk. They did step outside their communities to make this possible. I thank all of you for your attention. <laughs>